Tom Loy from Business Desk. With me is Carl Dieter from the Irish Mortgage Brokers. Carl is a well-known and well-respected commentator on the whole issue of mortgages, housing, and what's happening in the market. And that's what we want to talk about today. Carl, I have a lot of questions here, but I think if we summarize them, the main question is, should I buy or should I rent? What do you think about that? I think uh, it's important to look at what the motivations are. It's important to look at what your future holds. So you've got people who are younger, you know, they just finished college, they're into the workforce. For them, renting is probably a better choice. What you find is that people start to do things like get married, have children, then they become more into the buyer's market. But in terms of comparing the actual costs, there's two things. There's obviously what you're actually paying every month. People always look at property prices. They don't look at the cost. The cost of finance is going up, and it has been for some time, even though European base rates are dropping. Uh, what you've also got, though, is the cost of renting going up. And so really, it's, it's trying to make a play on which decision long term will make you better off. And what I would say in favor of buying is that buying a house is one of the few times where you can get a tax benefit, for instance, not paying any property taxes at first on buy until 2017, where uh, you also increase your personal wealth because every time you make a payment, your balance comes down. And assuming property prices aren't dropping, that is actually creating wealth. It's almost like a forced brand of savings. And you get utility. In other words, you get to live in the property. Whereas a renter only gets utility. They don't get the other things. So if you find that the two costs are somewhat comparable, then in long term, given that most of the wealth in Ireland is actually in people's homes, it, it can be a decision that will actually make you uh, wealthier in the future as to whether or not you believe that. I would just say, obviously, I work on property. I probably will say things like that all the time. Well, you know, there but, must be, but it's down to the specifics. There must and, be research about whether it makes sense to rent or buy at the moment, just in terms of the cost of what you get in terms of square mm -hmm. feet. Leaving aside what we don't know, we obviously, none of us know what will happen to property prices in the future. Let's talk about that in a minute. But right now, if I'm a family, maybe a couple, two children, should I be looking to rent or should I be looking to buy? Uh, it would largely depend on the area. Uh, for instance, you could rent in a rundown neighborhood for very cheap. If price was the only thing you were concerned about, absolutely renting and rent in a terrible neighborhood. Uh, if it was a case that you wanted to buy, you could buy in that similar neighborhood and probably buy for pretty cheap. What happens is that desirable neighborhoods, and this is true across the country, there's a premium on those properties. Uh, by people who want to occupy them. And you even see that, for instance, in auctions where they're selling repossessed homes, is that the ones that are invaluable or, or you know, areas that people want to live in go for a premium. Because normally what you do is you use an investment method and you'd say, look, here's what I'm paying in rent. If that was to be uh, turned into a capital value, and the way you do that is consider your rent as if it was a yield. Uh, it's like if you, if you give me a rental value, for instance, I can tell you what that person might want to buy for. So what you seem to be saying is, the property market is separating out in good areas, prices going up, in bad areas, prices are stagnant, it's still falling. Is, is that, and I mean, that, that seems to be borne out to a degree by what we can see from the property price register and so on. Is that your experience as somebody who's active in the market and talking well, to people every day? Yes, but I would also say that no matter what, how the property market is moving, either up or down, is that there's a premium in good areas that is above what the, the intrinsic value is. And that's the thing to remember. So you've got good areas in South Dublin, and even if the market crashed and only ever crashed, those properties would still sell for more than an equivalent property in, uh, in some other neighborhood that isn't seen as, as being as desirable. So uh, when you look at the market now, and that's a, a separate consideration, what you do see is that non-apartment homes in cities are starting to show some, uh, some bottoming out. Is that going to last? I don't know. Uh, is it something that has any future implication, I would say yes, because what happened is that for the last five years we weren't building any houses. And we do have a big stock of apartments and a big stock of property in places that people don't want to live. But in terms of you know, semi-D houses in Dublin, most of the supply at the moment is coming from probate, which is when people die, and from, uh, from existing stock and, and things like that. So you know, that has implications for the future. And uh, the rent or buy question is, is always one that people ask. Uh, what I'd say is that is there's simple calculation you can do. If you were paying a, a thousand a month in rent, uh, that would be twelve thousand a year. And that twelve thousand, if you were to say that represented a seven percent yield, uh, what you would see is that a capital value for an equivalent property would be about one hundred and seventy thousand. And that's that's using a thing called the investment method, where you look at rents as a yield of what the capital value should be. So if you're looking at a house 
uh, that you can rent for a thousand or buy for two hundred thousand, then you know that that thirty grand difference between the hundred and seventy and the two hundred is that premium that I was talking about. The bit that people are willing to pay more above the real value in order to occupy that property and call it their own. Well, let's come back to prices because obviously that's that's a big factor when you buy a house. We did a survey on on the independent um, website, and it shows that about half of our respondents think prices are going to fall further. Half of them, roughly forty percent, think they're bottoming out. The central bank recently uh, published interesting figures. They talked to two hundred professionals, people who were like yourself, people exactly who are in you're in that list. And the majority of them think prices are going to fall this year, and they think prices will fall again next year. And then they think they'll start to rise in 2015, bringing us back to where we are right now. I mean, what, what, what did you say when they asked you? Do you think prices are going to uh, rise or fall? Because clearly you were well, on I, the spot there. I took it in the neck because uh, in early 2012, I said that house prices were a buy, and that house prices in Dublin was the place to be, again, the non-apartment, second-hand home uh, in cities. And that's shown to not be a bad call, but the difference between someone talking about statistics and a guy like me is that this is live for me. So I had to tell my clients, you know, in late 2007, get out of the market, stay out. And now I'm saying it's time to get back in. Now, it's impossible to get correct all the time. And sometimes you can have luck on your side, but... Really okay, so you're calling it, you're saying, buy in Dublin now. I, I believe in Dublin... What about, for, for what about houses, not apartments, that the, the bottom is gone. Like we're past that point, and it will be in the rearview mirror now. What about the rest of the country, where the statistics are far less even, and where we're seeing a lot of falls in certain areas? What would you say there? I'd say for the most part, it's a slaughterhouse, and will remain that way, and uh, because the oversupply, the overstock tends to be in rural areas. Uh, you've got fewer transactions, you've got fewer jobs, you've got less economic reasons to be there. Uh, there's a lot of infrastru infrastructure that might not exist in rural areas that cities naturally have. Uh, and I think the, ad the advantageous let's position say, of, wait, wait, let, let's, let's be clear about what we're talking about here. When, you, when we say outside of Dublin, are you saying that Cork is a slaughterhouse and Limerick and Galway? Or are you saying the rural the rural? Sorry, when I talk rural, I'm not including Cork City, I'm not including right. Galway City. Uh, I would include Limerick City because it, it simply doesn't have the, the same size and some of the big employers down there had closed recently, etc. So, uh, do Ireland, I really see, as being a place with three cities. You've got Dublin, Galway, and Cork. Our focus primarily is on Dublin. That's what we know the best. Uh, and that's why I'm confident in saying that I believe the bottom is, is behind us. Now, does that mean, for instance, if you waited a year, you buy a house 10 grand less? People are saying, oh, great, you know, the price came down. Well, what was your cost? Because you had to rent in the meantime. So how much rent did you pay? And you know, now that you're buying into that one, is it precisely the one where you want and how you want? And that's the thing. It's you get into an area where, where people kind of bicker over the, the pounds and pence, property just isn't like that. And it's, it's not like a stock where every piece of it is the same. It's a really, really Personal. heterogeneous, yep. you know, every little one of them is different. Even on the same street, one has a north face and backyard, the other has a south. Well, they are fundamentally different. So it's really, it's about personal choice. Underneath, that's all it comes down to is personal choice and can you bear the cost. That, that, that's a given, but you know there are times to buy and there are times not to buy. And obviously, the last few years have been a time not to buy. So let's just come back. Yeah. Let's just come back to to areas outside of Dublin where many of our uh, readers and most of the population lives. What should they do? Let's assume two situations. Let's assume a couple who want to enter the market for the first time, and let's assume a couple who are in the market have a few children. It's too crowded. They can extend. They can just stay put, put up with it, or they can move. And then we have quite a few questions here from from people in exactly this situation. And what 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 do you think, in a general sense, somebody living outside of the main city should do? Well, if if you're looking to extend, I mean, you obviously have a property, and your decision is always: will I sell it and move somewhere else, or will I stay? Now, negative equity is an issue for a lot of people. At least half the homeowners out there have some. So. In terms of extending, sometimes that's the only choice people have because they, they can't afford to move. And negative equity mortgages are not a, a hugely uh, readily available product, meaning that for the vast majority of people, it's a case of staying put and how you adapt your home to be suitable to your needs as your needs change. Uh, otherwise, I would be looking at costs. So what is the cost of living in a rural town? Say if you were living somewhere in Roscommon, what is the cost of renting in that area? versus the cost of buying a house in that area. But if you think it's house. a slaughterhouse, mm -hmm. you know, values are going to decline further, aren't they? So it's not just a question of looking at costs. That, that just gives you a picture, a snapshot of today. But mm -hmm. you know, 
it's no good to you if, if properties prices fall another 30 percent in the next two or three years again but you see if prices fell for those three years, you'd have those rent for three years. And this is what I'm saying is that when you use the cost and the and the yield model, is it actually tells you what the what the implied capital price should be. And remember when I spoke about that premium on living there? Well in those areas they wouldn't have that premium because you simply would be saying it's not worth it to me in terms of risk to undertake the the potential downside. Uh, in short what I'm getting at is that it makes more sense to rent. If that's what I like it. too, that's what we wanted to hear. You know, that's, <laughs> that's <laughs> so about as direct as I can buy in Dublin, rent outside Dublin. Pretty much, that's, that would yeah, be my if advice. You, if, you, if you summarize it. Let's, let's come back to a few other things. Let's talk about negative equity. You mentioned it there. What are the options for people who are in negative equity in the market? And negative equity obviously is when your mortgage is larger than the value of your house itself. So what, what should people do in these situations who, who, for whatever reason, maybe they've got a job in a different city and they need to move, what should they do? Well, you've got two choices. You can either have a buyer's mentality and say, well, I want to move and I want to buy, in which case you'd look at a negative equity mortgage. Now, there is no come to our branch or bank or be a broker and get a negative equity mortgage. But what I can say is that the general rule is five times your combined income, five to five and a half times your combined income, minus your existing mortgage, is what you'll qualify for the next one. But you've also got to have a deposit. So give me some figures. Let's, let's take a, a okay. hypothetical case. Let's just say uh, if, if you were to in. you make 40,000, I make 40,000, and we have an existing mortgage of 150,000. Mm -hmm. Well, that would be 80,000 times five, which would be 400,000, minus that 150,000 mortgage, leaves about a quarter of a million that we could borrow. But we'd also have to have 10% uh, of a deposit. So you'd be looking at a purchase in the region of about 270,000, and our 25 grand would cover uh, would cover deposit and then some closing costs. Okay, so if you want to get out of a negative equity situation, you've got to start saving. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, that, that, that's, that's, if, big, that's if you're yeah. a buyer. Yeah. It's also I'm not going to be a buyer. Well, let's let's say you are going to be a buyer. You've got to start saving. And you've got to you've got to have a reasonably good salary. Mm -hmm. uh, it would be unwise for your wife to give up work, say that kind of thing. Yeah. You you really need to. Okay, what if you're not going to be a buyer? Well, then what you can do basically is rent out your house and go rent somewhere else. Uh, now, if it's the only house you have in the state, you're still actually covered by the code of conduct on mortgage arrears. So, you know, you actually are protected, even though you're an investor now or and, and acting as a landlord. That house is almost like a family home, effectively. But what if I'm on a you know track and mortgage, let's say. Um, this, is, this, is the, this is the secret bit that I'm, not, I'm going to get across to you. The house is covered by the Code of Conduct on Mortgage Arrears. All you do is write a letter to your bank, say, uh, I've been offered a job elsewhere, and I'm finding it very hard to pay my mortgage, but I do plan on keeping up my payments. Once that letter is with the bank, and because your house is now still legally covered by the Code of Conduct on Mortgage Arrears, you can't take away the tracker. Okay, so I think that's an important thing to, to that's, bear in that's mind. Because I know because yeah. my colleague Charlie Weston gets a lot of calls and phone calls and yeah. emails and letters about people on tracking mortgages, and they're very anxious about this gold plated mortgage. And you're saying if it's a mortgage on your own family home, even if it's no longer your family home, even if you're renting it out to a stranger for several years, for 10 years. Yeah. As long as it's your only property in the state, okay. then you are absolutely covered. You see, there's a difference between a consumer and someone who's not a consumer. Uh, so, for instance, if it's your family home, you live there, you're covered by the Code of Conduct on Mortgage Arrears. If it's your family home and you don't live there and it's your only house in the state, then you're still covered. If you were a couple and you had a family home and an investment property, you split up and one moves to each, each of those become a family home. Well, here's another question. What happens if you sell it in five years' time? Do you have to pay capital gains tax then? The, the way the CGT works on, on the family home exemption is that for the portion that it was a family home, uh, you don't pay capital gains. It will be the change in value between that time and whenever you sold it. You'll have CGT. CGT works on an apportionment basis, mm -hmm. which means that it's only to the piece that, that is wrong. What about income tax on, on the rent you're getting from the... Sadly, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's case five rental income, so you mm -hmm. will have to pay. And the issue there is that, you know, uh, in, in, in terms of policy, what we have is a state that says, you know, we need more houses. There's 100,000 people on the housing list. We've got shortages of certain stock, too much supply in other areas. You know, we need people to invest in property. But then what they do is they turn around and they make investing in property, you know, the worst financial. Well, this is it. Come up with. Anecdotally, it seems a lot of people are not paying income tax. Well, you know, 
that's tax evasion. Yeah. And, and obviously, I can never say that, the, that that's a good thing. That's <laughs> no, 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 don't, don't, don't try to say it, kids. But the, <laughs> it's, 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 yeah. You know, let's, let's, let's you've got, you've got, you've got okay. a lot of costs, okay? Yeah. And then you've got a lot so of... So you can write off a lot of the, the costs. You yeah. can. You can write off 75% of your interest. But the problem there is, for instance, say say you rent out your house for 1000 and your mortgage uh, interest is 1000 You're not even paying any capital. It's just interest is 1000 You receive 1000 in. According to the way that uh, the government have framed the taxation policy, is that you've actually made a profit of 250 euro that you have to pay income tax on. And you haven't. It's cash flow loss. If this was any other business, all of that uh, interest would be offsetable. If it was even commercial property, that interest would be offsetable. But particular to residential property, it isn't. And what that means is that you are probably going to have a tax bill. You're going to have costs that you can't set off, such as the non principal private residence charge. Uh, the old household charges in the same vein, and uh, even the property tax now is not uh, offsetable. They've said we're going to make it that way, but as it stands today, it, stands to it isn't. And what let's, that does let's is come is to juice the, let's come juice to the, the last level. bit of the, the equation, really. The last thing that people who have sent in questions and people that we talk to are worried about, which is are the banks open for business? Now, that's what your bread and butter is. You're dealing with the banks every day on behalf of people who want to take out mortgages. But what, what is what is your view? Are, are the banks serious about lending? And which banks are serious about lending? And which banks are not serious about lending? Look, the, the banks are lending. If they weren't if they weren't lending, I wouldn't be Carl Leader the broker. I'd be Carl Leader the broke. It simply would shut us down. Uh, what they are doing is getting very forensic and increasing uh, the the hurdles that they put in the way for people to borrow. And don't forget that when banks raise their rates, apart from hitting all the people who have loans, it also makes it harder for new borrowers because Loans get stress tested on the way in, and when they raise their rates, that stress test gets harder to pass. So they're not lending at anywhere near the levels that they probably should be. You know, the whole idea of the 65 billion costs of, of the bank bailout was so that banks would lend, and they're lending. Mm, but are you seeing are you seeing people who should be getting money? Are you seeing them being turned away? Absolutely, yeah. uh, and that's and why are they being turned away? Who's who's what? Are, you know, leaving aside all the stuff about whether it's right or wrong, and you know, the recapitalization. Leave that leave that to one side, and just talk about. How I can get a loan, and what should I do to make sure that I get a loan? I'm not one of those people who's turned away. Okay. Uh, in terms of why people get turned away, it's normally uh, a belief on repayment capacity, or else internal credit score systems, where the person's, where, where the underwriter says, you know, yeah, they do have a job, but they're in an industry that we don't think has that repayment capacity, and um, you know, so like the Give me, give me an example of that. Excuse me. Someone who's been uh, a teacher on contract for five years mm. and is being told, you know, for the foreseeable future, you're still going to be on contract. That's not a permanent job, no. Uh, but then you have someone who's on an IT contract for one year, and because IT is a hot industry, they actually can get a mortgage. So you've got this bias within underwriting. Uh, in terms of what you need to do, though, if you want to qualify, yeah. is really the, the key to the whole thing is show repayment capacity. So if you want to get a mortgage that might cost 1500 a month, uh, in order to do it, and that might be a place that's a quarter of a million euro at a you know five percent rate. Then what you've got to do is show that you're paying fifteen hundred euro somewhere. Now that could be a thousand in rent plus five hundred in savings. If you're living at home, you better put aside fifteen hundred per month and do it in an account in your own name, not in relatives. A lot of people do that. They like oh, I'll save in my mom's account because that way I won't spend it. Big mistake. Don't do it. Save in your own name. You know, don't be reckless. Uh, have no debt going into it, anything like car loans or credit card debt, diminish your borrowing capacity, and really just show the bank, I'm a good credit bet. Because ultimately, despite there's all a bit the, of a, There's a bit of a catch-22 there, isn't it? If you don't have any credit, if you don't borrow at all, uh, you often don't have a credit history. True. But you're saying just save the money, just sock yeah. it away every month, and then you do have a, a, something better than a credit yeah, history. Yeah, if you, if you want to borrow, okay, Proven. and you've got... Uh, you know, little savings and a good credit history, that is currently in this environment not as good as having good savings and no credit history. Savings are what you actually do. Credit was really about your appetite to borrow in the past and did you meet those obligations. But savings is a more reliable, uh, a more reliable variable for, for underwriters to work on. So really what you want to do is, is, is put aside the money, don't go into your overdraft, you know, don't go in, in online banking, or sorry, online betting. Uh, in your online banking is, is, is another thing. You know, be aware of the things that are coming out because we had a client one time that uh, 
there was a, a shop right next to the house they used to go to all the time for their eggs, their butter, etc. But it was also an off license to sell groceries. But the underwriter came back. Now, we did get it clarified and, and, and the loan went ahead, but it was like, why does this person spend 25 year on the off license every single day? Could they ever have to take time off work? You know, is there any other issues there that we should know about? And that might seem ridiculous, but your bank statements tell your life story financially. We, we had a story in The Independent not so long ago of uh, somebody who um, paid for SCAN, and the, the underwriters worked out she was pregnant and refused to loan on that basis. What yeah. should one do? Pay cash, I suppose. Uh, well, the thing Are is... Are there any other warning signs like this that, that, that trigger? Yeah, like, it, I remember that story. I remember thinking, like, how tragic, because that person could have been getting scammed because they were miscarrying. Absolutely. Like, there was absolutely no guarantee that that child will go to term, and anyone who's a parent understands those risks. And uh, what I would say is that banks actually do discriminate against people who are having children. Um, and <laughs> sure, don't have any kids. Well, yeah, we, we, we jokingly say don't have kids before you buy a house. But the other thing is is that if you do have kids, the amount that you can borrow, uh, the, the debt service ratio that you have comes down by about 250 per child. Yeah, but and that's that knocks about 50 grand off your repayment. That's, that's kind of logical. I mean, children are expensive. It is, but it's also logical to think that parents would be more inclined to try and support a family home and have a family home than someone who's footloose and fancy free and young. You know, they might just say, I'm going to Australia in the morning. Like, there's arguments on both sides. What I'm saying is, is that you, your best defense uh, is probably to have good representation in your lending. And now whether that's a broker or whoever's in your branch, you know, I would say the brokers because we are actually well, hired by our clients. Do, yeah. I would, yeah. absolutely would. But a branch manager, for instance, or someone who's banking within the branch is employed by the bank. And if, if, if something like that gets through, you know, they get a slap on the wrist. Whereas for us, it's just a victory for our clients. Who are the best banks to go to? Uh, AIB and Bank of Ireland at the moment are the best. Uh, followed in a, a kind of a very distant third by KBC. And then you've got the non-runners, who I'd call the, the donkeys of the horse race. Uh, they would be your permanent... <laughs> sorry. Your, uh, your permanent... I'm just picturing a donkey ride on the beach <laughs> with a little... I like that with racing, with AIB ahead, Bank of Ireland coming I'll tell you, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. Well, we're getting the weather for, for beach imagery, so... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Who else? Also Bank of um, Ireland. They're kind of... They're ahead of Irish permanent, but, uh, but behind KBC. Like, they are actually trying to make inroads, but, you know, at the same time, they're trying to close branches. They're trying to, to resolve huge problems with their lending book. Uh, the non-runners will also be the likes of NIB. So the, the, the list of who's lending is actually quite small. It's basically the, the, the two pillar banks. Now, in terms of what they're lending, you know, you're looking at roughly a billion a year in a market from each that uh, in a market that needs, you know, probably about eight to ten billion. And that's not my estimate. That's like people in the Department of Finance and various other independent economists would would come up with that figure. That's what a, a healthy credit market should look like. And we're still roughly about twenty five percent of that. Now, this year we were told that lending was going to double. I thought, wow, what a positive sign. We might finally get credit out there, even if it's at higher margins. What have we seen? The first quarter of lending was dead. It was smaller than lending last year, and yet transactions were up. Mm. Now, but what does that tell you? Transactions up, lending down. Tells you people are buying cash, cash. Cash, yeah. Precisely. And when you've got a market that's that, that's dominated by cash, that's not a sign of health. That's a sign that you are now like markets in Africa. Uh, you know, you're now like markets in South America, outside of uh, Buenos Aires, and you know, cities in Brazil. Where things are transacted in cash. Yeah, and it's a, <clears throat> that's the last question, I suppose. You know, you, you, you've touched on it. You're saying that it's, uh, well, let's say, a very peculiar market at, at, at the very least. It also seems to me that a lot of the property that is up for sale is not up for sale at all. Uh, how do you find the, the market? Do you think it's an honest, transparent market, or do you think it's an opaque, dishonest market where a, a lot of funny games are being played by so called ventures? Yes, there, there is a lot of funny games. Um, in terms of uh, you know how do they play out? Like this week alone, I've been affected by this exact problem where we put a bid in a property, it was accepted. I was waiting for contracts, then we got gazumped. Someone offered more. I was like, wow, I haven't heard of that since 2004. Uh, you know, three weeks go by, the state agent calls, says, yeah, the, the the person who made the higher bid, they're not in it anymore. You back in? I said, yeah, but we're going to lower our offer. Fine, we'll go sale agreed. I thought, great. You know, got the place for even less contracts signed and then the seller pulled it again because it's not over until the seller signs the contract. Uh, now what the hell is going on? I don't know. I'm told that property is going to be in an auction now but you know, you just don't know and especially with receiver sales you see all these kind of weird issues where they've got problems with the title, problems with 
someone else, you know, being on the deed that, that it wasn't necessarily known. There's, it's, it's a real mess, uh, and it makes it hard, and it makes it more expensive than it needs to be. I think that, uh, you know, when we look for transparency and regulation, and everyone's calling, oh, we need more regulation. We want to regulate banks more, but we don't want to regulate the industry that the banks lent on that this all went bad in. And the uh, property regulator hasn't, for instance, said that you have to keep a legal record of who bid on properties and what. Mm -hmm. So I mean, if you were selling a house, you could get one of your friends to come down and bid on it if, if some innocent third party bids on it, and then they think, oh, there's a higher bid on that house, but it wasn't. It was your friend. You know? so there you are. You, you think it's a fairly corrupt market, in, in pockets at least. And I, I would... <laughs> I think, think that I think that most well, of the yeah. people, uh, and and I do believe that most estate agents are good, but they can't spot. No, no, no. That's no, like, like you can act in good faith and still have bad things happen. It's a developer behind it, uh, or or some other party. All I'm saying is that you know it's it's, it's not a, it's not necessarily a corrupt market, but it is one that allows things to happen that probably could be easily avoided with some simple touches and some simple regulation that wouldn't make that big of a difference. Okay. Well, to summarize uh, summarize what we've had today. I think you're saying it may be wise to buy in Dublin, probably isn't wise to buy outside of the large cities. If you want to uh, take out a mortgage, go to AIB or Bank of Ireland, make sure that you've got a good record of savings, don't have a record of, don't have other debts, be careful who you're buying from because there are problems. Would that be a, a fair summary of the car dealer philosophy? Yeah, you pretty much know everything I know, so I'd like you to go back to my office for me and I'll get out in the sunshine now. <laughs> <laughs> well, for those of you who, who want more about property, don't forget to uh, look at tomorrow's Irish Independent, where we have uh, a lot of home truths about the property ladder, and Charlie Weston, our consumer, consumer affairs editor, will be giving lots of advice about how you can get your family up the property ladder. Thanks very much for tuning in today.